So if the hardware growth starts to slow down, and maybe a lot of the low-hanging fruits on algorithmic inventions have already been discovered at that point, then if we haven't hit AGI by that point, then I think we will eventually still reach there, but then the time scale starts to stretch out. Wow. And we might have to do more sort of basic science on how the human brain works or something in that scenario before we get there. But um, I, th I think there is a good chance that we are sort of, um, that the current paradigm plus some small to medium-sized innovations on top of it might be sufficient to sort of unlock AGI. Now, I want to be respectful for your time because I know that we're a little bit over. And uh, my last question to you is, uh, first of all, I can't believe that you're saying that this solved world could happen in a few years, potentially. Um, so well, yeah, let, let, let's be careful. Yeah, yeah, I think we can't rule it out. But so then, so what we could happen? Initi out, yeah. Initially, what could happen is we get to maybe AGI, which I think will relatively quickly lead to superintelligence. Mm -hmm. And then superintelligence, I think, will rapidly invent further technologies that could then lead to a solved world. But there might be some further delays of a few years, like after superintelligence, maybe it will still take it a few years to get to some something approximately technological And just because we didn't cover it, what is the difference between superintelligence and AGI? Well, AGI just means like general forms of AI, uh, that's okay. like maybe roughly human level. So think of AGI, one definition is AI that can do any job that a remote human worker can do. So anything that sort of, uh, you can hire somebody remotely who operates through email and Google Docs and Zoom. Mm -hmm. Like if you could have an AI that can do anything that like any, any human can do in that respect, that I think would count as AGI. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe you want to throw in the ability to control robotics, but I think that would be enough. That is not automatically the same as superintelligence. Superintelligence would be something that sort of radically outstrips humans in all cognitive fields mm. that can do much better, you know, research in string theory and in uh, inventing new piano concertos and uh, like envisaging political campaigns and, and doing all these other things better than humans, much better. So once you're saying we create superintelligence, then things just can happen super rapidly. Yeah, that, yeah. I think so. And, and I think... It's a separate question, but also plausibly, once we have full AGI, superintelligence might be quite close on the heels of that. So my last question to you is for everybody tuning in right now, like we're at a really crazy point in the world. And a lot of us are not like you. We're not like in, you know, in it, like, like really paying attention or really in this field, right? What is your recommendation in terms of how we should respond to everything going on right now? Like, what is the best thing that we can do as entrepreneurs, as people who care about their career? Hopefully things don't change too fast, you know? Uh, but but what, what I guess, what is your recommendation to us in terms of how we move forward in this world today, given everything that's going on? Yeah, I think it depends a little bit on sort of how, how you're situated. And I think there are different opportunities for different people. So, I mean, obviously, if you're like a technical person working in an AI lab, you have one set of opportunities. Um, if you're like an investor, you have a, another set of opportunities. And then, then there are, I guess, opportunities that every human has just by virtue of being alive at this time in history. Um, I, I would say a few different things. So like, in terms of, as we're thinking of ourselves as economic actors, I think like probably being an early adopter of these AI tools is helpful to sort of get the sense for what they can do and what they cannot do and uh, utilizing them as they gradually become um, more capable. Um, I think to the extent that you have assets, like maybe trying to have some exposure to the AI and semiconductor sector could be like a hedge. Mm -hmm. um, it gets tricky if you like asking about younger children. So like what would be good advice for like a 10 or 11 year old today? Because it's it's possible that by the time they are old enough to enter the labor market, the world could have changed so much that there will no longer be any need for human labor. But it might also mm -hmm. not happen, right? So <clears throat> if, if it takes a bit longer, you don't want to end up in a situation where suddenly now it's time to earn a living and you didn't bother to learn any skills. <laughs> and so you want to sort of hedge your bet a little bit. But I would say also uh, make sure to enjoy your life if you're a child now. Um, you know, not maybe only going to be a child once and uh, don't spend all your childhood just preparing for a future that might never actually be relevant. 
the world might change enough. Um, and, and then I would say, so if things go well, uh, these people who live uh, in decades from now might look back on the current time and just shudder in horror at how we live now. And hopefully their lives will be so much better. Uh, there is one respect, though, in which you, we have something that they might not have, which is the opportunity to make a positive difference to the world, a kind of purpose. So right now, mm -hmm. there is uh, so much need in the world, uh, so much suffering and poverty and injustice and just problems that really need to be solved not just artificial purpose that somebody makes up for the sake of playing a game, but like actual real desperate mm -hmm. need. So if you think having purpose is an intrinsically valuable part of human existence, now is the golden age for purpose, right? Like knock yourself out right now. Like now you have all these opportunities of ways that you might help in the big picture to steer the future of humanity with AI or in, the, in your community or in your family or for your friends. But like, if you want to try to actually help make the world better, now, now is really the golden age for that. And then hopefully if things go well later, all the problems will already have been solved. Or if there remain problems, maybe the machines will be just way better at solving them and that we, we, we won't be needed anymore. But for now, we certainly are needed. And so take advantage of that and try to try to do something to make the world better. Wow. We could be the last generation that has any purpose, which is just so of crazy to sort, think. Yeah, of that sort, of that sort of stark, urgent, these screamingly morally important type. Hmm. Um, um, it, it, it could be the case. So, um, um, so I would say that, yeah, those are the things I would say. And then I guess finally just kind of um, be aware. Like it would be sad if you imagine your grandchildren, you know, in, in, in your case, maybe a long, like 80 years from now or something, um, <laughs> but for others, maybe sooner, but they sitting on your lap and asking like, so what was it like to be alive back in 2025 when, when this thing was happening, when like AI was being born and you have to answer, oh, I didn't really pay attention. I was too caught up with these other trivialities of my daily existence. I, I didn't even really notice it. That, that would kind of be sad if you were yeah. alive in this special time that shapes the future for millions of years and, and you didn't even sort of pay attention to it. That seems like a bit of a missed opportunity. So, so aside from everything else, like taking care of your own and your family and trying to make some positive contribution to the world, just kind of um, you know, taking it in like this, if, if this is right, this is a very special point in, in history to to be alive and to exist right now is uh, quite remarkable. Yeah, so beautiful. I feel like this is such an awesome way to end the interview. Nick, you are so incredible. Thank you so much for your time today. Where can everybody learn more about you, read some of your books, or where's the best place to find you? Uh, nickbostrom.com, my website, and books and papers and everything else is linked from there. Yeah, his books are so interesting, guys. Super intelligence. Um, deep Utopia, very, very good stuff. Uh, Nick, thank you so much for your time today. I'll put all your links in the show notes and really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you, Ella. Enjoyed talking to you. Yeah, fam, what a thought-provoking conversation with Nick Bostrom. From simulation theory to the possibilities of a post-human future, we've explored some of the deepest questions facing humanity. What fascinated me the most was Nick's vision of a potential utopia, a world where AI succeeds so completely that all human labor becomes obsolete. As Nick put it, we could be entering a future of full unemployment. But in the most positive sense, imagine a world where we're training people to simply enjoy their life rather than for preparing them for careers that may longer exist or that they're not passionate about. But this leads us to a profound challenge that Nick highlighted, the problem of deep redundancy. When shortcuts exist for everything, when you can pop a pill instead of training hours and weeks at the gym to get fit, what will give life meaning and purpose? We might actually be the last generation with a purpose, living at a unique moment when human effort still matters. I love Nick's advice on how to respond to this massive shift. He emphasized the importance of being an early responder with exposure to AI while still finding ways to enjoy your life and to maintain purpose. As he noted, humans have an extraordinary ability to adapt, 
a quality that will serve us well as we navigate this transition with AI. For entrepreneurs wondering about their place in this new landscape, Nick offered a compelling insight in this solved new world. Consumers will not care just about what they're buying, but how it was produced and who produced it. This opens up an entirely new avenue for human creativity and connection, even in a highly automated world. Whether we're living in a simulation or not, Nick's perspective reminds us that the technological future we're building is very real to us and how we shape it matters profoundly. Thanks for listening to this episode of Young and Profiting. If you listened, learned, and profited from this mind-expanding conversation with Nick Bostrom, please share it with somebody who's curious about the future of humanity and technology. And if you picked up something valuable today, then show us some love with a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, CastBox, or wherever you listen to the podcast. It's the best way to help us reach more listeners. And if you love to watch your episodes on YouTube, we're on YouTube. All of our episodes are on there. You can also connect with me on Instagram at Yap with Hala or LinkedIn. Just search for my name. It's Hala Taha. And of course, I got to shout out my incredible Yap production team. None of this would be happening without you. So thank you for all your support. This is your host, Hala Taha, aka the Podcast Princess, signing off.